the excess uh, in terms of price movement that we saw uh, through COVID. And particularly after COVID, it's those excesses that are being shaken out of the market. The market, if you will, is rebalancing. A lot of these commodities are rebalancing more to a natural state of supply and demand versus kind of what we saw um, over the last couple of years. Well, Ryan joins us today. He is a CEO of Granite Shares, and we'll be talking about the economy and commodities and how investors should be positioned into 2023 and beyond. Well, good to see you again. Welcome to my new show, The David Lim Report. Great to see you again, David, and congratulations on the new show. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, always been a big fan of your work, so I'm happy to speak to you today about a lot of different things. But first, I want to talk to you about what investors feel right now are the most important issues. Certainly the debt ceiling uh, limit is has been on people's radar. It's near, it's near the end of May, and there doesn't seem to be a resolution made just yet. So is this really a concern for investors? I've talked to an economist who rated the chance of a default at up to 20%, which is not insignificant. What's your probability if you want to assign one? Yeah, um, I, I, I think, look, I think that we won't get to a default um, situation and I hope that common sense will prevail and we'll be able to, to move past this. But there is some chance that you know, we end up in a situation similar to what we had in 2011, where um, the debt ceiling ended up in a downgrade, a sovereign debt downgrade for the US for the first time, and the US lost its AAA credit rating. So anything like that, I mean, it's not a default, um, doesn't have to be that extreme, but um, even another downgrade or even just dragging these negotiations out where the treasury officially runs out of money, all, all of these things will be negative um, for the market. And we're already seeing that in terms of risk off behavior, you know, with the market down again today. I, I don't think this is a time when people are you know, jumping in um, with big buy orders. And if anything, people are loading up on gold and other forms of uh, hedge assets, you know, just in case, you know, something dislocates here. When we do, if we do get a, a sovereign debt downgrade, uh, first of all, what does that mean for, for interest rates on existing debt? I'm assuming it'll go higher, right? I, I think so. We were already seeing that in terms of yields moving up as people dumping uh, certainly shorter term treasuries uh, worried about that potential. Um, so yes, absolutely. If we were to get into a situation um, where you know, we were in, in a downgrade or you know, heaven forbid something worse, uh, I think you would see treasuries sell off. Um, but again, I think you know, people looking for, for hedge assets, looking to buy, buy gold at this time, um, but certainly not to take risk at this particular moment. Now, I'm looking at treasury yields. Uh, the 10-year yield has been in, in a range at around 3.5% um, for quite some time. Uh, the two-year note actually has been spiking up. So the short end of the curve has been, has been moving since the beginning of the month, moving up. Um, I, don't, I don't know if the short end of the yield curve is anticipating yield, uh, anticipating a, another rate hike from the Federal Reserve. Is that what that's signaling, right, Will? I, I, it, it could be part of it, but I think the main thing is just the risk dynamics that play in the market that, um, again, people are nervous about the debt ceiling, uh, and therefore that is being reflected you know, at the front of the yield curve. Um, so I think it's more, more that than what the Fed's going to do. I think the market largely expects the Fed to pause here, although very recently we've heard a couple of you know, Fed governors um, talk about the potential for, for more rate hikes. Um, but I, I would, I'd be surprised if we saw that, especially at the next meeting. I think um, the, the time is, is to pause, especially you know, after what we've seen in the regional banks um, over the last you know, couple of months. Yeah, There's certainly the. Re <laughs> what was that? There's enough risk out there. Um, okay, I want to come back to that, and I want to come back to what gold's role in all this is. Uh, but just in the note of of of, of a pause, uh, certainly we've seen Jerome Powell not agreeing with his own Fed staff about a, a projection of a mild recession by the end of the year. I wonder if he thinks that. Well, he said he verbally said that he believes growth will continue. I wonder if that's an indication, though, Will, that he thinks he's going to hike another time uh, sooner rather than later. And he did say that markets have been wrong when pricing in rate cuts this year. 
Um, so you're right about market expectations, but I just wonder if market expectations are in line with Jerome Powell's expectations. No, we'll, we'll have to see. It's obviously the big question because the market is expecting rate cuts, has been really since the beginning of this cycle. Um, and really the question is now that as we you know, roll into June, you know, do we see that you know, for the end of the year and how, how likely that is? And I think that I'm tend, I, tend to sort of, I tend to side with the Fed on this one in that you know, providing that we don't see something drastic happening um, in the economy, I think they have more room to keep rates you know, where they are for longer, and especially given inflation remains stubbornly high. Yes, it's coming down, but it's not falling like a stone. Um, and it certainly not, doesn't show any sign of you know, dropping close to the, the 2% mark. Um, so I think that does give them more latitude to just hold things where they are, providing the economy doesn't fall apart in the process. But I don't, I don't, think, I don't think that's, certainly that's not my case um, for the rest of the year. I think that you know, things are holding up quite well um, and obviously absent some, some shock from somewhere um, that you know, we, we're not fully aware of that I think the market can stay you know, fairly resilient. Now, let's talk about the jobs market because uh, the, other, the other indicator that the Federal Reserve looks at is the unemployment rate. So I guess, barring another shock, if a sudden rise in the unemployment rate were to occur, then the Federal Reserve would be uh, would consider a rate cut more seriously. Are you seeing signs, just based on your personal experience and anecdotes, are you seeing signs of labor market weakness, let's say in New York, where you're, where you're based? Yes and no. So yes, the trend has been since the beginning, you know, the, the, the pain, if you will, has been much more in the kind of high paying corporate jobs um, than anything else. But I still think the, the absolute number of layoffs are not enough or not significant yet um, to have that impact that, you know, the Fed's looking for. So yes, there is some weakness. Certainly, if you, if you look at, you know, new jobs posted, um, that's all weaker. Um, there's certainly nobody um, that's really talking about kind of aggressive, aggressive hiring in this environment. Most of the, the big hirers over the last few years, there are many ways you could, you could maybe look at um, some of the hiring that went on, or at least the environment that went on as being now kind of adjusting for a few years worth of almost continual hiring. Um, and now that's being reset, particularly in financial services, but in the tech sector as well. Um, but at the moment, absolute numbers are not high enough, I don't think, for the Fed to react. Which sectors do you think would struggle the most going into 2023? And which sectors do you think might come out on top when it comes to employment? Uh, I think it's the sectors that overbuilt, you know, over the last couple of years. So, you know, clearly tech um, is probably the most obvious one that, you know, massively overbuilt um, over the last couple of years. I think financial services as well, um, not, not the necessarily overbuilt. I think that, you know, with financial conditions, you know, largely staying, staying strong until the tightening cycle happened, I don't think there was really much incentive for firms to cut people. And that now will start to feed through um, as, you know, weakness shows uh, in the earnings forecast. And then clearly a lot of the consumer companies, again, that overbuilt um, over the last couple of years, We've already seen weak results coming out from Home Depot, um, from Target, from the retailers. That it, it's the same trend that overbuilt last couple of years, expecting that growth that we saw during COVID to go on forever, and clearly that didn't happen. So people are going to have to adjust. They are adjusting um, to that new environment. I think from a consumer consumer behavior perspective, you saw that with Home Depot, with Target, and even the Walmart results that we're going into a needs you know, versus wants, environment, uh, necessity, you know, versus discretionary environment where you're going to have, as a retailer, you have to have the right mix because people are now going to be more picky about what they buy and they're going to lean more to purchasing what they actually need as opposed to what they might want. So bottom line, how concerned, Will, are you about a dramatic economic slowdown sometime this year? Not as concerned about that, David, not for this year. And the reason why is just simply the earnings have still been pretty good. And I think we've looked at the, the earnings cycles now the last couple of quarters kind of expecting or 
you know, looking for any sign of real material weakness that hasn't shown up yet. The consumer still seems to be relatively strong. I'm not saying for one second that I don't see signs of things slowing down. I just don't think um, we're going to see that big drop um, before the end of the year. Uh, it still seems like companies are able to produce results, that they're adapting to interest rates uh, where they are. Obviously, the inflation numbers where they are. And yes, I agree things are slowing down, but I don't think we're going to see something dramatic by the end of this year. Uh, certainly, the commodities, and I'm talking about raw commodities, have um, have been falling. I want to ask you if these uh, price uh, price uh, slowing prices slowing down have been an indication of anything. So, copper has come down four four dollars and twenty five cents was the high in late January. Now it's at three sixty six. Lumber has come down, so the high was uh, five twenty four early January or late January. Again, similar trend. It's come down dramatically. Oil, as you know, has been falling, and um, and natural gas has has tumbled from its all time highs last year. These uh, commodities yeah. have all fallen in tandem. Is that are they pointing to a similar trend, or are they specific cases for each commodity, and it just happen to be a coincidence that they all came down together? I, I think when you look at um, something like that, where you see majority of commodities coming down together, it's rarely factors that are working or a coincidence that you know different factors for different commodities are working together to me it's just again um what we've been talking about that the excess uh, in terms of price movement that we saw uh, through covid and particularly after covid it's those excesses that are being shaken out of the market the market if you will is rebalancing a lot of these commodities are rebalancing more to a natural state of supply and demand versus kind of what we saw um, over the last couple of years. And when you see metals such as copper, aluminum, et cetera, coming down at the same time as you see oil and other commodities, it tells you it's more macro forces at work. And yes, again, we're slowing down. That is part of it. The China opening story, I think perhaps people got too excited about um, the Chinese economy opening up and what effect that would happen on commodity markets. I do believe that's a bullish factor for commodities, it's just going from such a low base, the zero COVID lockdowns to some state of normalcy will take longer than I think people expect. And yes, the quarter on quarter GDP numbers, you know, the Q1 is better than Q4, Q2 is going to be better than Q1. Um, but we're not going to see, you know, that demand come roaring back, I think, as fast as some commentators might have expected. You know, look at tourism, for example, you know, China, the biggest tourist class you know, in the world pre-COVID, in 2019, you know, China tourism almost two times the amount for the next biggest um, class of tourists, and that's US or Americans. And you know, since zero COVID economies opened up, domestic travel is rebounding, but international travel is still not there. So you know, the, the, the Chinese tourists are still not confident enough to get on an airplane and travel internationally. And of course, that affects you know, commodity consumption which it's going up, but it's not right now enough to compensate for the weakness that we see elsewhere. You know, with crude oil coming down, you'd expect airfare tickets to come down a bit. <laughs> it's not how it works. <laughs> I haven't seen them yet, David. So if you see any, then let me know. But, I, I, um, so no, far, I'm, I, I'm, I'm telling you they haven't because I was just traveling. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more, that's more the airlines looking to, uh, to make, make hay while the sun shines, as they say. Yeah, it's very frustrating. I'm, 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 I'm looking for. I'm waiting for Elon Musk to just build hyperloops to, uh, to link uh, China to the U.S. But uh, that's that's a topic for another discussion. Now, these commodities you, you mentioned, yeah, these these base metals have been have been have been slowing down. So, Will, would you argue that because in 2020 we saw global supply chain shocks really push up the prices of some of these commodities up to unprecedented levels in some cases, and so now we're just seeing a normalization of prices. Uh, and so this correction is not really an indication of a uh, huge economic disaster up ahead, but really it's just a normalization process. It's like what we're seeing um, with other parts of the economy where there's a rebalancing taking place, that the kind of crazy behavior that we saw over the last couple of years was an anomaly that's working its way through the system. You know, look at, look at car, your used car prices as just one example I pick off the top of my at the top of my head is that you know clearly for used car prices to appreciate that was ludicrous 
you know, that was a bubble that was always a complete and utter anomaly that should never have existed in the first place. It did for all the reasons that we know about, but now those prices are adjusting and you know, used car prices are coming down. New car prices are coming down. Again, as inventories you know, build up um, or these you know, shortages, these problems that we had over the last couple of years start to you know, ease up and become more normal again. Now, let's talk about specific commodities. Do you think that of the commodities we've discussed, the, the, the raw metals, uh, or the base metals rather, copper, and we'll get into um, a few other ones, uh, lumber, uh, another, another key commodity for housing, and, and oil, which of these do you think have the most rebound potential going into the next year? Well, I mean, copper for me, David, and the reason, the reason for that is it's a kind of a double whammy that, you know, first of all, copper is a economic indicator. So in China, as we all know, been big problems in the housing sector and, you know, copper is a key ingredient in new construction or any kind of construction for that matter. Um, so we're looking for more strength in that market and a recovery in housing is something good for the copper market. But the double whammy is it's not just traditional construction, which again, in the US, we're looking for, for a rebound in construction as well. Um, we're looking for the energy transition and signs that again, moving the global economy more to uh, a sustainable energy platform that we need copper. It's not just copper, other metals as well, but we need copper um, for that transition is everything that's electric. And if we want to electrify the world, we're going to need a hell of a lot more copper. And so that's what's going on. Um, but again, no signs of, of that increase uh, dramatically as of right now, but it's still a good story. Yeah, another price, another uh, key metal uh, that saw a dramatic decrease in price was lithium. Uh, it, it, it really it, it really fell tr- tremendously. It's back down to 2021 levels. It, so I'll put a chart up on the screen. And it, speaking of electric vehicles, again, this is this is a normalization of the price. It's not an indication of a uh, slowdown of demand for electric vehicles, is it, Will? Yeah, no, not, not at this stage, no. I mean, it's similar to nickel. If you look at what happened with nickel, um, you know, the, there was a huge short squeeze in nickel as um, you know, some of your viewers might be familiar with on the London Metal Exchange, um, which ended up in a, in a hugely controversial um, settlement or conclusion, if you will. Um, but that contract you know, still, I think, has to regain you know, some level of trust in the market. And that's why if you look at the price of nickel, the price of nickel has also gone down hugely. And nickel is, is another key uh, metal when we talk about batteries, battery technologies and, you know, electrifying, electrification of everything. So yes, it's not, it's not just lithium. It, it's all metals at the moment, but clearly there, there is a, a rebalancing going on um, of the fundamentals. And just on lumber, I want to ask you about lumber real quickly now. Well, I've heard this thesis that uh, because the lumber price has come down, that's an indication of a dramatic slowdown of a demand for housing. And uh, certainly uh, s- a slowdown from uh, demand for builders in particular, because they're the ones that need the lumber. And if builders aren't building, it's probably an indication of a slowdown in the housing market overall, which indicates, which could indicate a correction in the residential housing market. Is that something that makes sense to you? Totally. We've already been seeing that. I mean, like you said, the lumber price coming down. One of the main factors, and where does the demand come from for lumber, is the construction industry. And so you, you can't go from an environment where interest rates are zero to 5%. And clearly, from a mortgage perspective, it's much higher than that. The US you know, 30 year mortgage, we're talking anywhere, depending on the lenders, is 6 to 8%. Um, you can't go from zero to that kind of environment without there being some pain um, in the market. And clearly, what that has resulted in is a big slowdown in new construction because the financing conditions have tightened dramatically. So for anybody that is, you know, anybody that got a mortgage or did a refinancing, you know, in the last couple of years or before interest rates rose, those people are largely stuck. You know, they're only going to move if they absolutely have to because the financing is picture is going to change dramatically, which then leads people to get a mortgage today for a new house and we know that you know, mortgage lending conditions have tightened, so your ability to get a mortgage and the cost of that mortgage has meant, again, that the demand has, has naturally shrunk. We know that renters or 
rental market um, in many cities as high as it's ever been because people have to go out and rent. They can't afford to go and, and buy uh, new homes and spend money like that at the moment. So that, that's naturally reflected. And that's why when you see some stabilization in interest rates and before the debt ceiling conversation, we did see uh, a movement or a slight trending down in interest rates. Um, from a mortgage perspective, and that did, you know, provide some some you know respite to the construction industry and the home building market. But that that's going to be really tough, David. It's a really tough market um, because with interest rates this high, it's going to take a long time for people to get used to mortgages at this level, and they haven't been for you know for the last sort of twenty years. If household formation continues to climb higher over over the next few months, if not, you know, years. But if construction slows down, doesn't that put pressure on the supply side, which means that prices would go up? Prices of homes going up? Yeah. Because if you got if you got more people needing homes and you've got slowing down a slowdown in the construction sector in builders, as evidenced by perhaps the lumber market, would that not I'm just presenting a counter argument, would that not put upward pressure on home prices as demand continues to rise because people need homes, but I supply is constrained. For the moment, David, I think what's happening is it's not necessarily putting upward pressure. It's just stopping housing from dropping off a cliff. And you know, the, the counter argument to, okay, well, financing is increased dramatically, you know, mortgage refinancing or new mortgages are now unaffordable. So people can't buy new homes. The counter to that, is, well, like I said, if you got a mortgage, if you're in a mortgage, if you did a refinancing, you know, in the last couple of years before interest rates went up, you're not moving. So you're stuck. So you're not putting your, your home on the market. And therefore, the supply isn't coming onto the market. So if you look at the supply, just homes for sale, certainly around the New York area, you know, the inventory is going to be much, much lower um, than it has been probably at any point in the last few years. And that factor is kind of holding prices relatively steadily, um, or in other words, it's stopping house prices going into free fall. Finally, I want to talk about gold and risks. Uh, the two words that I just mentioned usually go hand in hand. This, the, the rise of gold prices up to $2,000 uh, earlier this year, what was that a response to, Will, if you could boil it down to one or two things? Um, to me, it was a reversal of the bullish dollar trade that we'd seen, you know, in anticipation of this, this massive rate hiking cycle. And so once the dollar peaked last year, I think in August, September time, you know, gold really went on a, on a big rally. And the icing on the cake, you know, for that rally um, was you know, a combination of factors, but the debt ceiling um, situation that we've seen right now in anticipation that that could, could get into trouble. And I think, again, a feeling that the Fed had paused interest rates and then from a real perspective that you know, interest rates would start to move down again, particularly towards the end of the year. So to me, those are the most, the most important things driving gold you know, in the last few months. Okay. Uh, people point to this correlation between the gold price and uh, going up and the decline in share price of uh, the regional bank sector. Uh, people point to the fact that perhaps the gold market was responding to bank collapses and gold investors were rushing to gold as deposits flowed out of banks. Have you noticed that? Have, have, your, have people that you work with called you up and said, I want to buy more gold or more bar, your, your gold uh, ETF, uh, because I don't feel safe with my money in the banks? Y yes. Um, short answer, that there's you know, a lot more conversations around gold and just the role of gold in a portfolio. And, you know, the two biggest beneficiaries of this, you know, have been gold and the treasuries, uh, because part of what's fueling the regional banking crisis is that people are saying, well, why keep my, you know, money in a regional bank where I'm getting zero, you know, in terms of an interest rate, when I can go and buy, put money at the Federal Reserve in the form of treasury bills and earn, you know, 5%. And um, so that's causing a big problem. Um, but yes, certainly, you know, People's concerns about counterparty risk, I think, are, are elevated this time, and certainly more so than we've seen over the last few years. 
Okay, let me provide you a scenario. Uh, there are countries in the world that are hyperinflating today. So Argentina, for example, the inflation rate, official inf inflation rate in April was 109%. And I think the government just raised their interest rates to 97%, their, their, their official central yeah. bank uh, policy rate. Uh, an, an Argentine would be somebody who would benefit from owning gold. It's just so expensive to buy even an ounce of gold in the regular citizen in Argentina probably couldn't even afford it, let alone, well, they couldn't probably afford rent right now with inflation the way it is, let alone let alone gold. What is the solution then? How do we make gold affordable to the masses? Do we, do we just create a product that's divisible or do we, uh, do we tell people yeah. to buy silver instead? Yeah. <laughs> What's the solution? I think the analogy I would use, David, is that it's the, if gold is insurance, you buy insurance, because you hope you'll never have to use it, but you buy insurance because if there is a disaster, you have something in place. The analogy with something like Argentina is you don't want to buy the insurance policy after the house is burned down because then it's going to be unaffordable. And what's happened in countries like that is inflation. This is again, the, this is a textbook case of how inflation can turn into hyperinflation. And by the time it's hyperinflation, it's too late. Because as, as you said, you, you're, you're earning your living, you've got your savings in the local fiat currency, and it's depreciating so quickly that you almost whatever you, you put in, you have to do it, you're raised against time, but by then it's too late. You have to have a holding in gold, or it could be whatever it may be, real assets, but you have to be in those safe haven assets before this happens. And this has you know, happened time and time again around the world. And that's why countries like Turkey, for example, um, that is itself experiencing huge amounts of inflation at the moment, why culturally there's a big affinity to gold because people know they don't trust the fiat currency. They can't trust the fiat currency. And so there has to be an alternative, but you have to have that in place already. Unfortunately, I know that's probably very uh, disappointing or disheartening to those that haven't, but you know that you, you have to you have to prepare for these things in the bar etf that granite shares has constructed uh tell us how that product works for the average investor who may not be familiar with etf so it's it's a product that tracks the gold price is it yeah. is it redeemable in gold as well okay so bar that bars is the ticker code so bar um is the ticker code for the Granite Shares Gold Trust, which is a gold ETF. And the whole reason it exists is so you can own physical gold in a portfolio. So it tracks the spot price of gold up or down, obviously, depending on the movement of gold. And the reason it does that is because we own physical bars of gold in a maximum security vault in London. And so by holding just physical gold, you get direct exposure to the spot price. The fund doesn't have any counterparty or credit risk. Um, that comes with owning gold derivatives or any other kind of proxy for gold. And very simply, it just does exactly what it says on the tin. It will track the gold price because it owns physical gold and anybody can buy it that has access to a brokerage account. So the share price is one one hundredth roughly of an ounce of gold. So take whatever the, the current gold price is and divide that by 100 and you get roughly the share price. So you can look at the share price and see the correlation. Um, but really, it's just designed so that you can own gold in the portfolio. And you know, not too long ago, it was difficult to do that, um, to own gold in a stock portfolio. And so now with everybody that has access to a brokerage account and everybody's looking to put you know, every asset they want to own in a brokerage account, that's where something like BAR comes in. Is it, It's a way that you hold gold in your brokerage account. Uh, you also have a bunch of, um, or a few uh, single stock ETFs. So Tesla, uh, Long Tesla, Long Apple, Nvidia, Meta, um, Baba. These yeah. are these are big tech companies. Before we close off, I want to do another segment with you later on and talk more about tech. Um, but yeah. for just for, for just for today, uh, your overview of the tech sector, um, the big tech names today, they've certainly taken a hit because of the the, the stock market last year. Uh, what do you think is going to happen this year? Are we do for a rebound. Yeah, I mean the, the performance. If you look at the performance of the market year to date. Surprise, surprise, when I said the market, the S&P 500, you know, surprise, surprise, it's all of the major tech names that are driving performance in the market. It's you know, the Googles, the Microsofts, the Amazons, the NVIDIAs, 
um, Tesla. It's, it's all of the stocks that were particularly out of favor when interest rates were ramping up dramatically last year um, to the ones that now are very much in favor in this market as people now start to focus on growth. And again, the reason is that the results have all been good. Earnings have been strong. Um, and there's certainly in cases where we've seen even you know, some weaker earnings, they haven't been as bad as the market is expected. And so those companies, you know, typically they're oligopolies or monopolies in their particular sectors. They have incredibly resilient business models and you know, very strong margins. And they're driving, so far today, they're driving the market higher. And if you look at uh, something like NVIDIA in particular, I'll just pick out because we have a a uh, leveraged single stock uh, ETF on NVIDIA, you know, that's become you know, part of his latest craze for AI. And you know, a company like NVIDIA has gone from being you know, highly correlated with semiconductor companies um, and you know, a big player in video games and even the metaverse, but that almost been completely thrown out of the window. And now investors are focusing on the next 10 years, which is you know, a potential AI revolution. And NVIDIA is you know, one of the companies I think that people would identify with immediately as being a potential winner in this AI race. And so we've seen a huge amount of interest in that. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks, David. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.